Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, Amen. Motherhood is about love. The greatest love is that we love the Lord with all of our heart, and soul, and mind, and strength. Trust that love is within you this morning. We're going to go to Psalm 127. Psalm 127 this morning. I'm going to say how delighted I am to have John and Rachel back with us. And... Uh, just to see them, and they're so useful here and so, so valued here. And I know you're excited to have them back as well. Our equipment even timed its functionality with John's absence. It, it just could not bear to deal without him, and so it just gave out today uh, when, he when he arrived. And um, there, is a, there is a special bond between John and and uh, the equipment here, and appreciate his many hours. Um, and he and I have formed a bond over the equipment <laughs> here as well. So uh, appreciate others as they help as well. But uh, Psalm 127 this morning, and I want to read this psalm. It's a short little psalm, and uh, it's been very impacting for me to study, very encouraging to study, and I trust, especially for our mothers this morning, that it will encourage your hearts. But there is something here for everyone, and... Uh, don't, don't close your mind because it's Mother's Day. Uh, the Lord wants to teach you something from this, from this psalm here. Psalm 127, it says, A Song of Ascents. This is a psalm that they sang on their way to Jerusalem, to the feasts. And it was written by Solomon, of Solomon. Verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays Awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, 
The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you asking that you would open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, quiet our minds from everything else that we are thinking of right now. Help us to focus completely upon your word, upon you, the God of the word. Pray that you would speak clearly through your word today. Encourage the hearts of mothers, encourage the hearts of fathers, children, singles. Lord, every one of us, may we be drawn to you as a result of our time here. We ask this, depending upon you, in Jesus' name, amen. When my wife first woke me in the early morning of June 13th, 2009, um, she was beginning the first labor pains for our daughter Whitney. It was very early morning. I forget what time it was. She could probably tell you the day and the, or the, the minute that it was. But she woke me up and she said, uh, the laborers, I'm having contractions. And like a good husband and father, I said something like, it's very important that you rest up so that you're ready for the delivery. And I went back to sleep. <laughs> In the, in the weeks following, there was times that we did not sleep. And uh, I've titled the message today, Parenting and Rest. And uh, you say, that's an oxymoron. Parenting and rest don't go together, um, especially early parenting, right? When the children are first born, infants are awaking in the middle of the night and all of that. But this, this, chapter, this psalm is about rest, in the Lord, and I want to show it to you. We're just going to survey the psalm real quick, and then we'll we'll look at the individual points here. I want you to notice the three the, the different themes that are woven together in this psalm. You have five verses, but there's there are an amazing number of themes that are intricately woven together here. The author wants to talk to us about vanity of building and vanity of protection. Without God. You look at verses 1 and 2 and you see the word vain three times. In verses 1 and 2, it is children, or uh, unless the Lord builds the house, vanity. If, if you try to build the house without God, you're laboring in vain. If you try to protect yourself without God, you're protecting in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early. All right, so vanity. He wants to talk to us about vanity. He wants to talk to you about your sleep schedule. Verses 1 and 2. Four times he references your sleep schedule. Or verses 2 and 3, I'm sorry. Um, no, 1 and 2. Um, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain. The watchman stays awake, verse 1. Stays awake. Vain for you to rise up early, sit up late. He gives sleep to his beloved, is the sense of the Hebrew there. He gives sleep to his beloved. God wants to, the, the writer wants to talk to us about our sleep schedule. He wants to talk to us about the gifts that God gives. Verses 2 and 3. He gives something to us. He gives sleep, first of all. And then in verse 3, 4, He gives children. He gives the fruit of the womb as a reward. He gives children as an inheritance. He gives children as arrows. He wants to point out in verse 2 that we are God's beloved. Notice that in verse 2, so he gives, and it's in the original here, his, to his beloved. He gives to his beloved ones sleep, is the idea. God gives sleep to his beloved ones. We are beloved by God. And then obviously in, cha in uh, verses 3 through 5, what does he want to talk to us about? Children. Three times he mentions children, fruit of the womb, children again. So, what do the children in the second half of this psalm have to do with vanity, building houses, protecting cities, and our sleep schedule? We say, I know what children have to do with my sleep schedule. They wreck it, right? Um, but what is, have you ever read this psalm? It's like, I get verses 1 and 2, 
All right? Vanity without, without God. Vanity without, without God's protection, without God building. And then all of a sudden, verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord. It's like, okay, Solomon, you just started another psalm. Did anybody tell you that? You know, um, what does the second half have to do with the first half? I believe that Solomon is telling us that children are an example of how God lovingly teaches us to rest in Him and how God builds our homes and He protects us. If you note, just for instance, I want you to, I don't want you to just take my word for this. Look at, look at verse uh, 4 and 5, and we talk about children being like arrows in the hand of this mighty warrior, okay? And the man that has his quiver full of these arrows will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now, what is the gate? What do you think of the gate of being? What is the gate? It's the gate to the city. Okay, and it's the Lord is protecting. If you go back up to verse one, except the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So the question is, how does the Lord guard your city? He guards the city through the children and he guards He builds a house. Children are a heritage from the Lord. He builds a house often with children. And so Solomon is wanting us to see that God is going to lovingly teach us to rest in Him as He builds our homes and He protects us. And this psalm is going to teach us three specific truths. Number one, our work is vain unless God works. So we must realize how dependent we are upon the Lord. That's the first thing that God wants to teach us in this psalm. We, we have to realize we're, it's vanity if, unless God works. So we need, to de- we need to realize how dependent we are on the Lord. Secondly, God gives rest in the midst of our work. So we must refuse to be anxious about our work. Third, parenting is a combination of work and rest in God. So we must relish our work of parenting while resting in God. First of all, our work is vain unless God works. Our work is vain unless God works. Verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The sense of the, the wording here, if you, if you look at it, is if God does not build the house. That is literally how it would be just transliterated into English. If God does not build the house, then you're wasting your time. Labor in, on building the house is useless. It's vain. If God does not build the house, our building is vain. That's the first thing we need to see. If God does not build the house, my building is vain. We pour concrete. We nail boards together. We pull wire. We install carpet and we paint. We do all kinds of other things. But who builds the house? We're watching a building go up across the, the street here. Um, I'm trying to run over it with my Jeep sometimes. But, you know, it's, we're, uh, we're, we're watching the house, we're watching the building go up. But who builds the building? Is this, does this, I mean, is this true about that building over there? Do you, do you think it's true about that building? It is true about that building. Unless the Lord builds the house, those labor in vain who build it. We pour concrete, we do all of these things, but God keeps us from building on a sinkhole. God keeps our heart beating. He keeps us free from paralyzing industry, in, industry, injury. And He gives us joy in what we do. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. You're not going to be happy with the house once it's built if God doesn't give you the capacity to enjoy what you're doing. God's sovereignty reaches anything that we create or construct. It controls everything that we do. Inventions, writings, works of art, relationships. Unless God does it, you're wasting your time. You can try to have to build a relationship with that person, but unless God builds it, it will not last. You can try to uh, create a work of art, to, to write something, to invent something, to produce something, to create anything, but unless God creates it, Unless God blesses what you're doing, you will have no joy and you will have no success. You say, well, what about all all of these people that don't even know the Lord, that have great success? It doesn't say that you have to realize that you have success from the Lord, but it does say that your success is from the Lord. 
the people that invented the iPad that I preach from right now don't realize that the success that they had comes from the Lord. And unless God prospers, we will not, we will not be successful. Ephesians, or Ecclesiastes 5, 19 and 20 says that God must even give us the power to enjoy the things that, you, that we create. If you want to flip over to Ecclesiastes, one of the most interesting books, I believe, in Scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, also written by Solomon. And he says, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly all the days on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. God, it, he gives riches and wealth, and what else does he give? In verse 19, he gives power to eat of it. He gives power to enjoy it. In chapter 6, Solomon says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. So this man has all this wealth, all these riches, everything that his heart could desire, and God doesn't give him enjoyment. God doesn't give him joy. Jim Berg said it like this. You can collect all the toys in the world around yourself, but only God passes out the batteries. God gives the enjoyment of what you pile up around yourself. And Solomon, of all people, ought to know this. Solomon piled high all of the enjoyments of life, all of the things Solomon built, Solomon created, Solomon wrote, and he piled all of these things, and at the end he said there's no batteries. None of this stuff runs. None of this stuff works because only God passes out the enjoyment. Only God can give enjoyment in what we have. If God does not build the house, our building is useless. Our building is vain. This doesn't just apply to motherhood, friends. This applies to everything in your life right now that you're creating, building, or trying to do. If God does not prosper you, if God does not give you the ability, then what you're doing is useless and it's wasting your time and it's an offense to Him. If God does not build the house, our building is vain. If God does not guard the city, our protection is in vain. Now the picture here, we're back in Psalm 127. The picture here is of a city with a night watchman who stays awake. Some, some of you have been in situations like this. I thankfully have not been in a situation where your life is continually in danger and you are literally depending upon someone to stay awake. Well, I'll take that back. All of us have driven through the night, right? Some of you sleep in the passenger seat while your, while your family member drives. You're depending on them to stay awake. And it's not, it's not the same, but unless, unless God watches the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The watchman would have to stay awake all night because often the enemy would attack at dawn. Sometimes when you're in your deepest sleep, the enemy would attack and the watchman would have to stay awake. And God says, if, God, if, I, do not, if I do not guard the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. We take measures to protect ourselves through alarm systems, cameras, personal training classes, weapons, police forces, military thankful for all of these things. But God's sovereignty reaches anything that we protect as well. Friends, you can, have, you can have all of the resources at your disposal, at your fingertips to protect you and your family. You can have all of the resources at our fingertips. We're the greatest nation on earth. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for our strong military and all of these things. But our hope cannot be in that unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. God's sovereignty reaches everything that you try to protect as well. Not only everything that you create, but everything you try to protect. So our work is in vain unless God works. So we have to realize how dependent we are on the Lord. 
have to realize how dependent are we on the Lord this morning? How much do you realize that you're dependent on the Lord? I, I said this earlier about, about something else. The issue is not whether or not you're dependent on the Lord. You are dependent on the Lord. It's how much you realize you're dependent on the Lord. What you do, God blesses because the goodness of God is upon our lives. The goodness of God, Romans says, leads us to repentance. God blesses us so that we will turn to Him. But we have to realize that everything that we do is dependent on whether or not God wants it to be done. We say this sometimes, the best laid plans are only what? Plans. They're only plans. To plan, to build, to protect without acknowledging God is arrogance. Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Some of you know this passage well. James 4. Book of James after Hebrews. James 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say what? If the Lord wills. We say, Lord willing, I will do this. We shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. To, be, to plan, to build, to protect without acknowledging God in your life is arrogance. Some examples of this. May 31st, 1911, in England, the HMS Titanic was launched. And an employee of the White Star shipping line stated not even God could sink this ship. Titanic sailed from Southampton for New York on April 10th, 1912. A few days later, she was at the bottom of the Atlantic. Why? Because of a few rivets. You study the Titanic sinking. It was the rivets, little tiny rivets. Not tiny, but tiny to, compared to the Titanic. Rivets were faulty. Bumped into the iceberg. The rivets failed. Five watertight compartments flooded. That's over the limit that the Titanic could have. And she goes down, splits in half under the water, she's still down there today as a monument to this verse. Except the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, July 2nd, 1863. Little town of Gettysburg. Some of you have been there. Used to live a few hours from there. Battlefield, one of the bloodiest battlefields of the Civil War. July 2nd, 1863, Union Brigadier General Governor Warren discovered a hill called Little Round Top. It was at the south side of the Union Line. Union Line was shaped like a fish hook at, at uh, Gettysburg. The south side of that line was weak. It was anchored. It wasn't really anchored. It, was, it ended at Little Round Top. Little Round Top was completely undefended by Union troops. I've stood numerous times on the top of Little Round Top. It's a small hill. Um, be compar comparable to Mount Trashmore downtown. Okay, You're standing at the top of this hill and you're looking and you can look down the Union line. They could lob cannonade shells down the Union line and if, they could, if the Confederates could have taken this hill, the Battle of Gettysburg could have turned out very differently. And if the Battle of Gettysburg turned out very differently, they were north of Washington. They could make a flanking maneuver. And the, the Civil War could have turned out differently. But Governor Warren discovered this hill undefended by Union troops. And he called the Union Army into action just in time to secure the hill before the, Feder the uh, Confederates could gain the high ground and destroy the Union lines. And you study military history, there are a thousand times that a battle was lost or won because one general ordered one more charge or one courier was delayed or one message misinterpreted or what, whatever. Something, something went wrong, something went right. It just goes to show you, except the Lord protect the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Friends, our lives are under the control of the Lord. Have you realized... Have you realized today 
your deep dependence upon God for everything that you do and, and protect. You are breathing right now because God wants you to breathe. Your heart continues to beat and your blood goes round and round inside of your body and your air goes in and out because God wants it to. And everything that you do, everything that you take credit for and everything that you produce and, and protect is done by God, given by God as His gracious gift to you. Have you realized your deep dependence upon the Lord for everything that you do and protect? Number two, God gives rest in the midst of our work. Psalm 127 the middle here says that it is vain, verse, verse 3, it is vain for you to, to rise up early and to stay up late. And if you, if you look at this verse, it's like Solomon changes his form here. He's talking about building, uh, he's talking about protecting, and then he starts with vanity in verse 2. It's vain for you to rise up, sit up, to eat the bread of sorrows, and the sense here is the, the bread of anxious toil, of hard labor. For so he, he gives to his beloved sleep. An overdriven and anxious approach to our work is useless. And that's the sense here. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. And these three things go together. Rising up excessively early is difficult especially when you do it without the Lord, when it's just you. Staying up late, some of you are early risers, some of you are night owls. You know, Sitting up excessively late to make something happen without the Lord is totally useless. Eating the bread of sorrows is eating, as I said, the bread of anxious toil. It's this overworking, overthinking, overcommitting, spreading yourself so thin. And this driven nature, overdriven nature, these words communicate the, the approach to life like, I'm going to make this happen. If it kills me, I'm going to make this happen. And sadly, it does sometimes kill people, overwork themselves. Does work require early mornings and late nights sometimes? Yes, legitimately, it does require early mornings and late nights. But if, a, if that be begins to take over and we become, the world has a word for this. What, what does the world call this? workaholism okay it's it's this addiction to our work and it's defining ourselves by our work and it's this overdriven anxious toil eat the bread of anxious toil rise early stay up late make it happen now I want to be clear I'm not against working hard strong work ethic is essential but if you're running on adrenaline and stress it's vain. It's useless. It's empty. It's not from God. It's not what God wants. It's useless, he says, for you to rise up early, to sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows. Why? Why does God say it's useless? Because he gives sleep to his beloved ones. For so he gives his beloved sleep. It's not beloved sleep like sleep is beloved. We love sleep, okay, but to his beloved is the sense. God gives to his beloved ones sleep. God gives sleep to His beloved ones, is the sense here. You ever realize how much time you spend sleeping? One third of your life <laughs> you spend sleeping. If you live 90 years, you spend 30 years asleep. That's a long time, all right? But sleep is built in. It's a God-given reminder that we're weak, that we get tired. Some of us, when we get tired, we just like the most spiritual thing that you can do right now is to go to bed. <laughs> you know, go take a nap, please, for all of our sakes. Um, because we get our brains get all strung out and we get all stressed out and, and we can't think clearly. And sleep is this built in God given reminder that that's the, that's pretty much the end of all you can do right now. You need to go to bed. You need to stop. Well, what about this? What about I know I know go to bed. And God's built in this reminder that you, you have to stop working. You cannot work 26 hours a day. There's not even 26 hours in a day. You can't, you can't work 20, 20 hours a day. You have to stop and commit it to the Lord. He gives sleep to His beloved ones. Now don't miss that word. What does God call us at the end of verse 3? He, he calls us His beloved ones. We are God's beloved ones. 
God loves you this morning. And what He's doing in your life is an expression of His love. The fact that you get tired at the end of a day is God's gift to you. (laughs) God gives you sleep. He gives you rest. He gives you rest of all kinds, not just physical rest. He gives rest uh, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. It's an expression of God's love for us. What does that mean for us? God gives rest in the midst of our work. So we must refuse to be anxious about our work. God built this in where we have to stop and we have to, Psalm 46 says, we have to be still and know that He's God, not us. It is, it is He that hath made us, He says, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Be still and know that I am God. How about this one? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Jesus looks at these people and He says, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And this, the idea here, the picture, is, is uh, of, a, of a boat that's just laden down. The, the idea of, of something laden down in the water or a, a cart that's overloaded and you're having to pull this or a, a backpack that's bulging with heavy stuff, a burden on your back and you're just bent down, bent over. And Jesus says, come to me all you who are like that, who are rising up early, sitting up late, eating the bread of anxious toil, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I'm not going to completely unburden you. I'm going to put my burden on you. Take my burden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm meek and lowly at heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he says. Luke 12, 22, Jesus says to them, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll, what, or nor for your body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food. Guys, you hear that? Life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. Life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. Don't worry. Don't worry. God gives rest in the midst of our work. God's built this in so that we will be still and know that He is God. But stress levels in America are higher than they've been in years. I was reading a statistic that 70% of parents today are stressed out about their kids. 70% of parents. Do you accept your need of rest as a gift from the Lord? Do you, do, you, do you accept the fact that you get tired as a gift from the Lord? Do you refuse to be anxious about your work? Is there something right now that you're anxious about and you're like, I have to make this happen. I have to work hard on this. I have to do this. And I'm going to stay up tonight. I'm going to get up early tomorrow. And it's not that you just have a work ethic. It's you're stressed out. You're eating the bread of anxious toil about this. God gives us rest in the midst of our work, so we must refuse to be anxious about our work. Moving on, thirdly, parenting is a combination of work and rest in God. Parenting is a combination of work and rest in God. Verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. God gives children as an expression of His love. Verse 3 starts out with what word? Behold. Behold means listen, look. We need to understand something that we might miss here. Look, children are a heritage from the Lord, an inheritance given to us by God who loves us. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And the sense here is a compensation, a comfort. Think of these ladies in Scripture who initially could have no children. Think of Leah, Jacob, or I'm sorry, Rachel, and uh, and Hannah, and these others who, who could have no children. And God looks on them. And He gives to them children. 
And it's, he, he compensates them. He comforts them with children. Psalm 113.9 says, He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Now, he's just, he wants us to see God, God is the one who gives these, these children. And they are an inheritance. They're a gift. They're an expression of His love to us. When children are born, God is building our house. God is at work in our lives. I want to be sensitive here. God does not always give children. That is for reasons known only to Him. I wish I could explain that. But God, whatever God does is good. God's gifts are always good. God only does good things in your life. God only makes beautiful things. He doesn't make ugly things for eternity. He makes beautiful things. He only is making beautiful things. And God gives often children as an expression of His love. God also gives children in verse 4, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. They're like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. And the word here is the word used to describe David's mighty men. Sometime in the future, I'm doing a sermon on David's mighty men. I already have a title. I'm calling them the Noble 600. Um, It it was an incredible group of men who we'll see tonight, I trust, um, Lord willing. uh, We will see them take on uh, the Assyrian... Uh, the Assyrians and the Ammonites, David's mighty men. And maybe some, maybe a handful more thrown in. But these mighty warriors, what are they armed with? Like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. A skilled archer with a quiver full of arrows in this day was respected as much as we would respect a sniper with a fifty caliber today. A skilled archer, a skilled man with a sling. The Bible says they could sling stones at a target and not miss within a hair breadth. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> um, we miss today in archery. I love archery, but I miss within a hair breadth all the time. <laughs> These men, time after time after time, within a hair breadth, they were hitting the target every single time. The, uh, the accuracy, the marksmanship was amazing. And it says children are like that. Children are born to men and, and women and, and they're like arrows in the hand of one of these warriors. It also says they're, they're children of one's youth. And that's a good thing, right? If you're, if you're young, you can stay up all night, several nights in a row and, and be okay. But uh, the children of one's youth The man who has his quiver filled with arrows will not be ashamed when confronting his enemies. On the other hand, if you look down and you have no, there's there's nothing there to defend, um, you're, you're concerned. The man who has his quiver filled with arrows will not be ashamed when confronting his enemies in the gate. And the sense here is the city gate was where transactions occurred, where judgments were made and confrontation happened. Uh... Multiple times in Scripture you have in the gate of the city is where these things happened. Um, Your enemies would gather in the gate and they would look at you perhaps menacingly. They'd bring uh, cases against you and accuse you of certain things. Or perhaps you're facing an invasion around your walled city. You shut the gates and you look out over the gates at these enemies standing there. Whatever the case, it it could be an actual invasion... Or just picture a man standing, facing his enemies in the city gate. There are these people that live in other parts of the city and they've got something against him. It says, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. The the sense here in the word speak, it can also be translated subdue, to conquer, to crush their enemies in the gate. And this man has these, these sons and these daughters standing behind him, looking over his shoulder, as it were, and it's like he's armed. You've seen the TV show Bonanza? You may have seen the TV show Bonanza. Okay. Ben Cartwright 
stands there and he's confronting someone and there are three guys standing behind him and their names are Adam, Hoss, and Joe. And you don't mess with the Cartwrights, all right? Now, that's a TV show, but it, it really is a picture of what it means when, when he's standing confronting his enemies in the gate, he's got these arrows standing behind him, all right? And some daughters are like this, too. You don't mess with them, okay? Uh, they're, they're, they're defending. Um, they're, they're arrows in the hands of a warrior. What is God, what is God showing us here? Parenting is a combination of work and rest in God. So we must relish our work of parenting while resting in God. We make great efforts to raise our children. Does it require us getting up early and staying up late? Yes, it does. Do we, though, in the midst of that, embrace our need of rest? And at the end of the day, you have to look and say, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord protects the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I am, I am raising these little ones, or not so little ones, <laughs> for the Lord. And unless God builds the house, unless God prospers what I do, it's in vain. I'm trying to protect these children. I'm trying to protect my family. But unless God protects us, it's in vain. And ultimately, at the end of the day, who's the one who builds? Who's the one who protects? It's God. Now, my conclusion is let go and let God, right? I mean, just forget it. I'm just going to be over here watching TV. Unless God builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. So why even try? Unless the Lord protects the city, they, they, the watchman stays awake in vain. So I'm not going to stay awake anymore. I'm going to sleep, you know? And let go and let God, right? No, it's, it's not that. He says, they labor in vain who build it, but they still labor. It's just God has to bless their labor. The guy still has to stay awake all night. But God blesses his staying awake and he shows him that little flicker of a spear over there as the sun rises. That glint off of the shield of some guy over there that's ready to, to, to pounce on the city. God wakes the city. God keeps the watchman awake. And God, friends, shows you that look on your son, your daughter's face. Just in passing, but God shows you. And you ask questions, and it comes out that something's wrong. There's, there's something that's happened, and they need to talk. And, and God's the one that does that. You could be as oblivious as anything to it, but God's the one that shows. God's the one that gives you the sense. But you still work, you still labor, you still protect. Beautiful picture of this, an explanation of this is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I return to this quite often in my own life and even when I, when I share messages here. It is... It is the fact that we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God which works in us both to will, to want, and to do for His good pleasure. Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I work out because He works in. I can't. He, he won't change my life. He won't, he won't do things in my life without my cooperation. But I can do nothing without Him. The two have to go together. It's not let go and let God. It's take hold with God. And God uses my action. God uses my watchfulness. God uses my efforts at building and creating and working out my salvation because He's working in me. Why does God do that for us? The most important part of the entire message is right here in verse 2. Why does God do all this for us? Why does God give us sleep? Why does God protect our families? Why does God build our houses? Why does God give children? Because He loves us. We're God's beloved. 
What is our attitude of life as a result of knowing that? I'm just going to I'm going to shoot real straight with you. If you're stressed out today, you are not living this song. If I'm stressed out today, I am not living this song because I'm not acting like God's beloved. I'm not embracing the rest that God gives. I'm not coming to Jesus and taking his light yoke upon me and learning from him because he's meek and lowly in heart. I'm not living as Jesus wants me to live if I'm stressed out today. On the other hand, if you're lazy today, if I'm lazy today and I'm not taking action and protecting and seeking to learn and protect and nurture and build my family, then I am falling short of the grace of God. There's strength to do something there, but I'm not experiencing because I'm sitting on the couch. And I have to take hold with the Lord, but I take hold as God's beloved. I act and I parent and I build and I create as God's beloved. Our work is vain unless God works. We have to realize how dependent we are upon the Lord. God gives rest in the midst of our work. We must refuse to be anxious about our work. And specifically here, parenting is a combination of that work and rest in God. So relish your work of parenting while resting in the Lord. If that doesn't apply to you this morning, parenting, let me ask you, are you embracing work and rest properly? Are you, are you looking to the Lord to work out your own salvation? Have you accepted God's love upon your life? Do you know God this morning? Friends, that's the first thing. That's the first entry point in experiencing this psalm. What you do in this life, if you don't know God, you're literally going to watch it go up in smoke someday. And it's going to be 80, 90 years. If you live that long, it's going to be 80, 90 years of uselessness before the Lord because you never knew Him. He's, he'll say literally to you, depart from me, I never knew you. What a tragedy to stand there and never know Jesus, never know God. If you do know Him today, we talked about this in Sunday school, are you living a life that's worthy of Him? If you are staying up late, going to bed uh, late, uh, getting up early, eating the bread of anxious toil, stressed out about anything, it could be parenting, it could be, it could be anything, then God wants you from this psalm to realize all of my stress is useless without Him. So turn to Him and embrace the rest that He gives. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for this truth from this psalm. I don't know how You're applying it to various lives this morning, but I know that we all need it. Our tendency in this life, in this country, in this time period, is to be stressed, to be anxious, and to forget the rest that you can give and the strength that you can give. Lord, help especially our mothers this morning. Encourage them. Strengthen them in this time of their lives. Some raising children, some influencing their children, having already left the nest. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage them. Lord, encourage fathers as well to take action, but to take action with you, resting upon you, realizing that unless you build, they're laboring in vain. Unless you protect, they're protecting in vain. Lord, each one here, Lord, whatever their stage in life, teach us this truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.